So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, now the last speaker of today, so Christian Ottem, and who will tell us about the integral Hodge conjecture. So please. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks. First of all, for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, I have very nice memories uh, of Gail uh, from when I was a student, so it's nice to to be speaking here. And uh, and thanks. Uh, uh, for everyone uh, for tuning in here so late. Uh, um, yeah, I, I guess I, um, I'll give four talks about this uh, integral Hodge conjecture, which uh, was mentioned in Emanuela's talk uh, this morning. Um, I decided, I mean, it's sort of a big subject, so I, I decided to sort of divide it evenly into sort of four lectures and, and um, um, the, the idea is that these four lectures will be somewhat independent. So even if you miss lecture number two, you could still sort of uh, drop in uh, on the, the later lectures. I mean, they, they, they won't be sort of, um, I mean, yeah, they will be quite in, independent. So here's a sort of preliminary schedule. Uh, um, we'll see if uh, this is actually how it will turn out, but uh, um, maybe I'll say a little bit more about the, the goals of the lectures. Um, so, uh, so the integral Hodge conjecture is, is related to this um, big problem in the mathematics, the, the Hodge conjecture. And sort of the, the overall philosophical question is, you know, how do you detect whether a given cohomology class is, is algebraic? Um, this is a very hard uh, problem. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting to investigate techniques to detect uh, or obstruct the, the algebraicity of a, of a cohomology class. Um, but um, it's sort of an interesting problem for, for various reasons. I mean, it relates to the rationality problem. Um, I mean, uh, there are certain birational invariants that are constructed uh, from uh, the integral Hodge conjecture. And also certain problems in arithmetic geometry, um, the existence of, of uh, rational points, stuff like that. I'll, I'll try to say a little bit more about that in uh, lecture three. Um, but I, I guess the main sort of goal of the lectures will, will be to showcase a few um, techniques for, for producing counterexamples to the integral Hodge conjecture. So, you know, constructing pro um, varieties is, is, a, is a hard problem in algebraic geometry. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, an, an important uh, thing in, in, the, in these lectures to construct sort of varieties with, you know, very intricate behavior or, uh, um, yeah, weird uh, topology or something. So, so I'll, I'll try to sort of highlight how to, in a given situation, try to, uh, construct varieties explicitly with uh, given properties. I'll, I'll probably involve a little bit of topology, um, like standard operations. I'll try to um, uh, invoke uh, uh, the more sophisticated things from topology that I'll, I'll need, but um, yeah, so, so hopefully it will be sort of self-contained this. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that was, uh, that, um, maybe the earliest uh, technique that was used in, in, in integral Hodge conjecture. And um, nowadays, I guess uh, people uh, typically use degeneration techniques. So, so this is what I'll, I'll explain today, I guess. And finally, I guess on Friday, I'll say more about um, like positive results uh, for like cubic fourfolds, threefolds and stuff like that. So it's not, going to be all about the counterexamples. All right, so I figured out, I mean, I'm not going to assume anything about uh, you know, complex geometry. So I, I decided to keep this lecture very elementary. Um, so the first part will be um, familiar to many of you, I guess, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll move on soon enough. Um, so I'll let X uh, be a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers and, and N will usually denote the complex dimension here. 
Uh, and uh, because we're over the complex numbers, we can, uh, I mean, we have a singular cohomology group, which is defined using, well, the Euclidean topology on, on X. So it's, it's a sort of interesting thing that on X, you have both the Euclidean and the Sariski topology. And this will be very important. Um, and, the, and for X, we have the Hart's decomposition, which says that the, the singular cohomology with complex coefficients decomposes uh, as a direct sum of, uh, of smaller uh, complex vector spaces. So you can think of these pieces as the realm uh, cohomology classes of, of uh, PQ forms. Um, and, uh, or, or you could uh, say that this uh, piece here is, is given by the sheaf cohomology group of, um, of, of P forms. Um, yeah, so it's, as I said, it's sort of an, a non-trivial uh, thing that's, that's happening here. Here you have um, the Euclidean topology, whereas here you have a cohomology group, which is computed in the Sariski topology. And this decomposition here, it has these uh, uh, famous properties. You have the hard symmetry, which says that um, the complex conjugate uh, of this piece is, is the, um, the flipped uh, piece here. And you also have uh, serial duality, which is uh, an isomorphism. Uh, yeah, so basically if you, if you make a table out of these uh, numbers here, or, uh, then you, you have two symmetries of that actually. So this was proved by William Hodge in the, I think, 40s. Uh, this is uh, what he looks like. Um, yeah, let me just do one example, maybe. So if you haven't seen this before, I mean, these, these pieces here, they're, they're easy to compute um, uh, in a given example. Like, like uh, if you have a cubic fourfold, there are many exact sequences you can use to uh, compute these groups. Um, and the answer is given here. Um, the even, uh, um, so yeah, so H0, H2, H6, and H8, or they're all one dimensional and all the odd cohomology uh, vanishes. So basically the, the only interesting part is this uh, H4, which uh, has this uh, hard stink position here. Uh, yeah, so if you draw this uh, array of numbers, you get what's known as the, the hodge diamond, and uh, yeah, it looks like this. Okay, um, yeah, so that was cohomology. Um, in algebraic geometry, there's sort of a more natural um, thing to, uh, to look at. This is uh, the Chow group, uh, so it's defined by taking the free abelian group generated by all co-dimension R um, subvarieties um, and you mod out by, by rational equivalence. So it's, uh, I mean, for each R you have a group and uh, you put these together and you get the, the chow ring. Um, yeah, so this, uh, this was uh, defined by Wei Liang uh, Chow. Um, in the, I think, 50s or something. Um, yeah, so two very basic examples, Chow zero, that's co-dimension zero cycles. It's just given by uh, the only class uh, of co-dimension zero, that's X itself. And then you have divisors, uh, um, co-dimension one sub radius, which is uh, uh, the Picard group of X. Uh, so maybe another uh, example is given by the um, by a surface in P three. So here that the Chow one is um, is a finitely generated group, um, so it has ranks uh, row where row is this uh, Picard number. But the the Chow group of co-dimension two cycles um, that that is a, a very very complicated group. So this is. Uh, not uh, even finite dimensional. So this was proved by Mumford. Okay, so in general, these groups are, are very complicated, um, but luckily one could, can sort of study them in, um, by comparing them to, uh, um, to uh, 
usual cohomology groups. Uh, yeah, this thing here, uh, one thing about Chao is that he was also a very famous uh, stamp collector. If you go on Amazon, you can actually purchase this uh, stamp collection um, that he, uh, he wrote <laughs> for $65. So yeah, um, yeah, anyway, some Chao trivia there. Um, Okay, anyway, for, for, a, um, for a sub variety of X, uh, you, you can define the uh, fundamental class, uh, which is uh, basically defined by pushing forward the uh, fundamental class or the, the class one from H zero uh, um, from, from Y. So basically, uh, what you have to do here, if, if this is uh, not smooth, you have to take a resolution and then uh, you push forward uh, the class one from, from this resolution here. Uh, so every sub variety gives you a class in integral cohomology and then it's a theorem that this respects rational equivalence. Um, and uh, so you get a well-defined uh, map on, from the Chow group to the integral cohomology group. Okay, so it's um, sort of an, of an easy computation that um, when you take a sub variety um, and, and you look at it in terms of the Hodge thing position, it has to lie or it has to land inside uh, the space of RR uh, cycles or in the classes of type RR. Um, so formally, these are the classes in. Uh, integral cohomology that map to the type R R uh, classes in the um, in this uh, complex uh, vector space here. Um, so, for instance, any any torsion class will uh, lie in here um, because uh, torsion cycles they they uh, <laughs> they map to zero in in here. We call this group here the the, the subgroup of integral Hodge classes. Okay, um, maybe uh, time for another example. So if, if we take a cubic fourfold, um, then well, chow zero is just Z, the fundamental class of, of X. Um, and uh, the Picard group of, of X is given by Z, and this is uh, by the left shift hyperplane theorem. Um, a much uh, or <laughs> much less trivial theorem is that the Chow group of co-dimension two cycles is, is 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 just a finitely generated abelian group. It's it's given by exactly the 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 space of uh, integral um, degree four classes. So I mean, th this step here is is non-trivial. It's really saying that. Um, <clears throat> Anything in a uh, in here is is algebraic, and the the Chow group maps injectively into cohomology. Um, yeah, but uh, if you go to co-dimension three cycles, uh, this is a very complicated group. It's not finitely generated, and um, yeah, it's somehow related to the uh, Chow group of zero cycles on um, on the variety of lines. Yeah, so this is very big. Um, and uh, yeah, if you go all the way to uh, the co dimension four classes, that would be point on X. Uh, this is just Z again, because this is a rationally connected variety. All right. Um, are there any questions so far? Well, Please free, uh, feel free to interrupt uh, whenever um, I do like uh, receiving questions. Okay, so um, now we've come to the statement of the integral Hodge conjecture, which says that um, if you take this subgroup of the integral cohomology of I mean, the integral Hodge classes, the map from, from the Chow group in here is, um, is surjective. So any integral Hodge class is algebraic. It comes from a formal combination of algebraic sub on X. 
Okay. Um, so, sort of the, the more famous variant of this is the, well, the, the Hodge conjecture, which is basically the same statement up to multiples. So it says that um, it's the same statement uh, tensor Q. So any, any rational uh, Hodge class uh, should be um, a rational linear combination of um, algebraic subvarieties. Yeah. So of course this is a big open problem, um, but uh, actually this is not uh, an, an open problem. So this is not even a conjecture and uh, it hasn't been a conjecture for uh, 60 years. Um, so the first counterexamples to the statement uh, was produced by Atia in Hitzebruch in the 60s. Um, so they gave an example of a smooth projective uh, sevenfold with a non-algebraic uh, torsion class. Um, so as I said, torsion classes, they are automatically here because they map to zero in, in um, in complex uh, cohomology, so the, so they're um, Hodge, but but they prove that this torsion class does not come from an algebraic subvariety. Yeah, so this is a picture of uh, Tia in Hitzebruch, I think, standing outside the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics. Um, I think I'll I'll try to prove this theorem here tomorrow. Um, this is a result which requires a lot of um, preparation in terms of topology, but I think it's, uh, it's doable in, in one lecture. So I think I'll keep it more elementary today. Um, so uh, here are a few of the known results. And the, the main uh, result here is, is the case uh, quote dimension one. Um, so it, it says that, um, well, if you have, uh, so this would be in, in what, in H2, and if you look at the degree two Hodge classes, this group here is generated by turn classes of, of algebraic line bounds. So this is uh, a, a known as the Lefschetz 1-1 one, one theorem, it's proved by Solomon Lefschetz in the 30s, I think. Um, because it's, I mean, it's an interesting proof. So I, let me just actually, actually go through the, the proof here. And just to highlight that this does, does not work for sort of any other co-dimension. Uh, and there are many steps that fail. Um, so the, the first step is this isomorphism um, that we can think of the Cha group as, uh, as the H1 of the, I mean, as a cohomology group here. And uh, so the, the mar remarkable thing here is that there, we can uh, we can we have the exponential sequence that allows us to to study this cohomology group in terms of um, the cohomology groups of Z and, and the cohomology group of uh, the structure sheaf. Um, so here it's important to again uh, compare or be sort of careful about which topology we're using. So here we're actually in the analytic topology, this exponential map is holomorphic. Um, so if we take these, uh, this exact sequence of analytic sheaves, we get um, a long exact sequence uh, that looks like this. And uh, we can identify a few of the, of the maps here. Um, so this map here uh, from H1 of uh, O star to H2, this is the turn class map. And, and the map that goes from H2 to, of, of Z to H2 of OX, this can be realized as uh, first mapping into complex cohomology and then projecting onto the uh, H02 uh, factor in the, in the Hodge decomposition. So we, we also know exactly uh, how to interpret that map. But uh, basically what we, we get now is that, well, the H11, um, that would, I mean, all of the, the classes of type 11, they would map to, to zero here. 
Uh, and that's exactly the kernel of, of this map here. Uh, so the so PR is this projection up here. So by exactness, this uh, here is the image of the, of the previous map. So it's basically saying that uh, this group here is, is equal to the image of that thing. Um, so in words, it means that any integral one one class is the churn class of a complex analytic line model on X. And okay, so at least now we can interpret the elements here as uh, you know churn classes of you know complex line models on X. But then there's a sort of big sledgehammer we can use by by Gaga. Any any uh, complex analytic line model here uh, is is actually algebraic. So these classes that we've produced they're algebraic, and, and so we're done. Okay, so I, I decided to include this because. Uh, well, um, well, first of all, it's sort of the only degree where the, or non-trivial degree where the integral Hodge conjecture is, is true. But as you see that the proof couldn't possibly, I mean, there, there's sort of nothing that could uh, generalize to higher co-dimensions. Right, okay. Let me say a little bit more about um, the Hodge conjecture. Um, so, uh, of course, the integral Hodge conjecture implies the usual Hodge conjecture, but there's sort of one extra case where we know that the Hodge conjecture is true. That's for uh, curve classes. So when the when the co-dimension is n minus one. So the statement is that uh, because we're on a projective variety, I have an ample divisor. And I can consider the map from H2 uh, to H uh, to n minus two, giving by, you know, taking the product with this uh, class here, the n minus two power of, of H. And the statement of the hard Lefschetz theorem is that this is an isomorphism. So any class here comes from a product of, uh, you know, H or, and, and then, uh, um, a class in H2. Um, yeah, so this is a, um, a map that respects uh, the Hodge decomposition. Uh, so it means that if you have a class which has type, um, I guess it should be uh, n minus one minus one here, uh, then these, these classes are products of divisors. And products over divisors, they're of course, uh, they're of course algebraic. So yeah, indeed any, any curve class um, is algebraic. But again, I, um, I emphasize that this is a result that holds strictly for, um, for rational coefficients. Um, you know, here you could imagine, you know, scaling H and, uh, you know, you would have the same conclusion, but uh, yeah, so then, yeah. <laughs> It's really um, no way of, of trying to get a statement for uh, for integral coefficients using this argument. And in, in fact, there, there are three folds where the Hodge conjecture is, is uh, true, uh, but, but the integral Hodge conjecture um, fails. Mm, yeah, and uh, yeah, I think this is the main result for today. Uh, this is the sort of the easiest counter example to explain. This is Collar's uh, theorem from around 92, I think, which does exactly that. I mean, it, it's a it's a threefold where the, the Hodge conjecture is true, but the, the integral Hodge conjecture fails. Okay, so what's the statement? So, um, so X will be uh, a very general uh, hypersurface of degree p cubed, so p is some prime number, uh, at least five. So the smallest example is, is a, a very general uh, hypersurface of degree 125. Uh, and the statement is that in that case, uh, h4 um, is, uh, is just z. Uh, it's generated by um, a Hodge class. And, and any curve on X has a degree divisible by P. 
Okay, so what does that mean? Um, well, it means that this class here, well, what are the intersection numbers here? So here we have uh, we have a class L. Sorry, maybe I'll add some color. So um, so this this class L oh, um, satisfies. Uh, it has degree one with respect to the polarization. Um, but this second statement really says that any curve has, uh, has degree divisible by P, which means that uh, this class L is not algebraic because it has degree one with respect to, to H. So in, in this example here, it, um, P cubed times L is algebraic, but, but L itself is, is not uh, algebraic. Yeah, so this was proved by Janusz uh, Kolar. Um, maybe I should emphasize a little bit this word uh, very general. Um, it means uh, that while you have a parameter space of, of hypersurfaces, and uh, it means that you pick your hypersurface to be uh, contained, uh, well, Outside of a countable union of a Sarisky closed subsets, so this is a you know projected space of all hypersurfaces. You re you remove countably many divisors, and it's true for everything uh, in that uh, <laughs> intersection. Yeah. Are there any questions about this uh, statement? So hopefully we'll get to prove that in, in a bit. Okay, um, so before that, I, I just wanna uh, say a little bit more about sort of the, um, the, the, the general properties of these, uh, of the integral Hodge conjecture. Um, so it's a sort of an interesting question, like to compare the, the Hodge conjecture with the integral Hodge conjecture. Um, so we can define the, the Voisin uh, group, degree 2R, uh, as, as the quotient of the space of Hodge cycles divided by the algebraic classes. So ideally, we would like to say that any integral Hodge class is algebraic. Uh, so that's not always the case by Collar's uh, result. But this quotient here is still an sort of interesting group uh, to consider, um, sort of measures the, the failure of, uh, of the integral Hodge conjecture. And in, in, indeed, the, the Hodge conjecture itself would imply that this is a finite group. So it's sort of a, yeah, presumably a, a finite group that you can attach to uh, any smooth projective X. Uh, yeah, and this group here is um, is non-trivial in, uh, in Kolar's example, but we don't know exactly what it is. We just know that it's uh, one of these three groups. Um, yeah, so even for hypersurfaces in in P four, these questions are are hard. <laughs> yeah. All right. So mm, there are sort of two special cases that are most interesting. Um, it concerns the C4, and which would be uh, H22 uh, two, two divided by algebraic classes. So these would correspond to co-dimension two cycles on, on X. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. And also the dimension one cycles are, are also interesting. Um, in, uh, in that case, we know that the, the Hodge conjecture is true, but uh, Indeed, this, this group here can still be non-trivial. And these are interesting because they're uh, birational invariants um, for, for smooth predictive varieties. So in theory, that they could be, I mean, they, they could be finite groups that are, uh, that could sort of be used to, to tell whether or not uh, uh, a hypersurface or some, some varieties is rational or not. Of course, they're hard to compute, but uh, yeah, it's sort of an interesting thing that you that these uh, that these bi rational invariants uh, show up. Um, yeah, so in in this um, 
I mean, it's really not that hard to see that they're birational invariants. Um, in fact, let me just sketch the proof. Um, so if I if I take two smooth, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, two smooth projective x and x prime, and assume that they're birational. I want to show that well, if if the integral Hodge conjecture here is true, then it's also true over here. But uh, because of the weak factorization uh, theorem, uh, we can factor this uh, birational map um, by the sequence of of blow-ups in smooth uh, sub-varieties. Um, and the, the whole point is that uh, if we do that, we know exactly how the, the cohomology changes. So we saw this uh, earlier in uh, Caroline's uh, um, talk uh, when she computed the uh, um, Picard group of, of a blow-up. So if we consider the case of co-dimension two cycles, or sorry, the, the degree four classes, then uh, basically, it, well, if, if this is a blow up of something smooth, well, um, the H4 of this thing is just obtained by the H4 downstairs. And well, the, there's a sort of pullback here, I guess. Plus, you have the H2 of the, um, this, the thing that you're blowing up. Um, and if I only care about sort of the, the Hodge classes, um, I see that this decomposition here uh, respects the Hodge decomposition. So I know also exactly how the, the group of Hodge classes uh, decomposes. And here I, I have the, the group from downstairs. And I see that the only thing that I add is, is uh, classes of type 1, 1. And there, I, by the left just 1, 1 theorem, I know that everything there is, is uh, algebraic. So every, and it, everything here is, or Something is algebraic here, if and only if it's algebraic there. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So I prove that the integral Hodge conjecture holds here, if and only if it holds here. And then, yeah, basically that, that gives you the argument. Okay, and there's a similar story for the, um, the, the curve classes. Um, any questions about this? Okay, um, I think in the remaining 20 minutes or so, I, I'll try to prove Collar's uh, results about um, uh, the hypersurfaces in P, P4. So I'll try to give a full proof of this result. It's, it's so concrete and I, I think it's, it's a, it really showcases a very nice method. So I think it's, it's worth to, to go through it. So again, please feel free to interrupt when there, whenever something is not clear. Um, actually, this is uh, something that uh, will appear um, also in the um, talk on uh, Wednesday, uh, oh, sorry, Thursday. Um, the sort of specialization method. Um, let me say what that is. So, so this is sort of the, the main technique to produce counterexamples to, to the integral Hodge conjecture. So the setup is that we have some sort of family of, of varieties, x, x over t. So t is the parameter space. Um, and so say that we want to sort of disprove the integral Hodge conjecture for, um, for the very general fiber. So the example to have in mind is that we want to disprove the integral Hodge conjecture for a very general uh, hypersurface in P4. So here, the, the parameter space T is, is the sort of the, the linear system of all um, hypersurfaces in, in, uh, in P4. Okay, so here's sort of a, a point that maybe looks trivial, but, um, but it's a, sort of a miracle. But, so uh, it's if I if I take um, a sub a sub variety of, of of a very general fiber, so so here I, I pick some very general point um, t 
in T. And then the key is that um, all of those subarrays will extend to all other fibers. So if I take some subvariety over this uh, over this uh, fiber here, assuming that this is very general, then maybe after a base change, then basically any any uh, subvariety here will sort of deform out um, to any other fiber. Um, yeah. So so starting with this, I, I actually get a family that lives over over to dominate T here. Okay, so, so that's something that's useful because uh, typically, um, you know, it might be easier to analyze a special fiber. So if we try to say disprove the integral Hodge conjecture, well, what does that mean? Well, we, we, we need a class and we need it to show that it's not algebraic. Um, and one way to do that would be to say, well, suppose that it's algebraic, then, well, any, <laughs> then it would also have to sort of um, survive uh, when de degenerating into uh, the special fiber X0. And, and this X0 could be easier to analyze, or you could sort of know that this uh, X0 have, uh, has some like special, special properties or something. And this turns out to be sort of the, the technique that, that, um, that produces uh, the most examples. Um, let me say a little bit more about <laughs> what I actually mean here. Um, so there are sort of two ways you could try to extend cycles. Um, so if I have uh, a family like this, say over, over a curve, and suppose that I have some family that's defined by, or defined over maybe an open set in the base. Well, then it's sort of obvious that I can Get a family of cycles that are that that's defined over the whole um, uh, family here, just because we can we can take the Sirisky closure of the family. So if I even if I start with a subvariety here, I, I can um, complete it just by taking the Sirisky closure. But this Sirisky closure could be sort of complicated; it could break it into to pieces. So, yeah. And this also works uh, uh, with respect to rational equivalence. So any cycle over this open set will extend to a class uh, in, the, in the Chow group of, of X. And, uh, and the recipes, again, just take the series key closure. OK, so again, this may look like a trivial thing, but it, it really is sort of a nice thing to uh, contemplate, I, I think. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of key difference between algebraic geometry and, and topology. So if you think about child groups as sort of the algebraic analog of, of cohomology, then whenever you take an open set, um, you'll always have surjections uh, when you restrict to uh, this open set. Uh, just because you have this uh, way to go back by uh, going, taking this risky closure. So if you think about that problem in topology, that, that's, that's uh, much more subtle because there's an exact sequence, um, the, the exact sequence of relative cohomology. And, and here, this group here may, may certainly uh, fail to be zero. So, so you don't, there's no way of taking a cohomology class and you know, extending it back to, to X. And in fact, this is one way to sort of interpret uh, some of these counterexamples. All right. Um, yeah, this is um, this was not, and this was just a sort of a warm up for the the actual statement. So let me say a little bit more about the how you extend cycles from a very general fiber uh, to the whole family. So the setup is that we have some some family uh, over T. And then, uh, well, if we assume that the, these fibers there are protective, then we have a, the relative Hilbert scheme, which um, parameterizes closed subschemes in the fibers of uh, this um, morphism F. And this is uh, a very useful scheme. It has a universal family of, of, um, 
of fiber or, or, or close up schemes in the fibers. Um, and yeah, so basically, um, so H will parameterize the closed sub schemes. The fiber here will be the sort of the points in the corresponding sub scheme. And then of course, each such uh, scheme will map into X. And what's important for us is that uh, this Hilbert scheme here has only countably many components. Uh, because uh, one way to, <laughs> to define this uh, Hilbert uh, scheme is to use Hilbert polynomials and there are only sort of countably many Hilbert polynomials uh, available. Okay, so let now uh, H prime be the union of all the components so that this uh, uh, that do not dominate uh, T. So, the, so this is not surjective. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess in the picture, it would, you, you take all the subschemes in the fibers uh, that do not extend. <laughs> okay, uh, so if you take that, you get some countable union of, of closed subsets in, in T. Okay. Um, but then if you take some point um, that's outside that uh, set T prime, well, by definition, it means that any subscheme will deform out of, uh, of, of this fiber here. See, if, if I take this very general point, take any sub variety or a subscheme, um, there will be some component of the Hilbert scheme that contains this and that components will, component will completely dominate uh, T. So this, this uh, subscheme will, will deform out. Yeah, so, it'll, it'll, so it, I, I say this a little bit informally, there's a sort of base change here, but uh, yeah, this is the precise statement. Okay, and uh, yeah, so basically what we get is a specialization map from the very general uh, fiber to uh, the special fiber. So if I just, start with a very general point and pick any other point uh, zero in, in T, I can, I can map cycles here onto cycles here. And this is compatible with intersection products. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, maybe one more re remark. Um, yeah, so here we just needed the family to be projective. If, if we just, if you really take a smooth family, uh, so where all of the fibers are smooth, then we can actually identify all of the cohomology groups with, with exactly this special fiber, uh, just because this is uh, uh, differentially uh, trivial, this, uh, this family here. So the consequence is that if you have a class here, which is uh, algebraic um, on, on the very general fiber, then uh, it stays algebraic uh, when you specialize to the, the special fiber. Yeah. Uh, any questions about this? No, I just wanted to say it was really cool. Yeah, it's a kind of useful technique. Uh, now I'll apply it uh, several times, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's just see how it works in action. Um, I think it's, this is maybe the, the simplest uh, example um, due to Collar. Um, so yeah, so the statement, let, let me keep it uh, as simple as possible. You, you take a smooth hypersurface of degree 125. If you don't like the number 125, there's a lot of work that can <laughs> go into reducing it to 48. Uh, it's not so important here, but um, in any case, uh, the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem uh, from before gives us a description of the cohomology groups. H2 is just given by Z and H here is the hyperplane divisor. Um, and, uh, and then we have this class L from before. Um, so this is just some, some 
class. Uh, it doesn't have any geometric interpretation. But it, it's, a, it's a class that pushes forward to uh, the class of a line in, um, in P4. Um, yeah, of course, if you take um, a very general hypersurface of degree 125, um, there are many, many conditions <laughs> that uh, um, for it to, to contain a whole line. And in fact, the very general one uh, does not contain a line. So, so this L here is not the class of a line on X. Um, of course, there are special uh, uh, hypersurfaces of degree 100, 125 where the integral Hodge conjecture is true, namely the ones that contain a line, but, but the very general one um, fails the integral Hodge conjecture. So, so everything in this example will follow from the following claim. Uh, if you take any curve on this very general hypersurface, then the degree of that curve is uh, divisible by five. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll see the, the point of five in a, in a second. Okay, so again, we, we want to use this uh, technique using the specialization that we can sort of move out uh, cycles. And uh, it takes the following form. So if there exists some hypersurface x0 in, in uh, x4, uh, so that this uh, congruence here holds, um, then it also holds on x. So x is very general and yeah. So one way to think about it is, well, if you have a curve that violates this uh, congruence here, well, you could take the limit of that uh, curve and you would get um, a counterexample also on, on x0. And uh, yeah, you would, uh, you get a contradiction. But here, the interesting thing is that X zero can be sort of horribly singular. It's, it can, doesn't have to be uh, normal. I mean, we just need to be able to talk about sort of the degree of, of curves. Um, so how does uh, Kolar um, pick this uh, X zero? Well, it's a very clever argument, um, of course. Uh, so you, you pick uh, five uh, very general um, degree five, uh, I mean, degree five polynomials, homogeneous, of course. Um, and they define the morphism from P3 into P4. Um, yeah, and, and you let X0 be the image of that morphism. Okay, so we can compute immediately that the degree is 125, it's five cubed. But we see that this X zero has to be very, very singular because it's the image of a rational variety um, in P4. So it's, you know, smooth 125 uh, uh, degree surfaces, uh, hypersurfaces there of general type, but this one is actually unirational. So. Yeah, uh, so it, it's very, very singular. Um, so one way to think about this X zero is to, uh, well, we can take sort of the space of, of all uh, quintic polynomials. Uh, so we map P3 into um, P55. This is the space of all quintic polynomials. And then we can take a generic projection uh, down to uh, P4. So if I, instead of taking five, I take a basis for, you know, all the quintic polynomials, that, then I end up in P55 instead. So we can view this X0 as, you know, taking P3, Veronese embedding, and then project down to P4. Um, but this is very important. That this sort of way to view X0 as a projection. Um, because we have the theory of, of generic projections. Um, so this morphism here, um, well, first of all, it's finite. Uh, yeah, there, there are no, I mean, the only way that it could be 
non-finite would be that there's the whole uh, line that's uh, uh, that gets contracted here, but uh, that doesn't happen uh, uh, generically. Yeah, so it's it's finite. Um, it's uh, birational onto its image, and it's it's two to one on the surface um, in P three. So one way to think about this is that well, I I have my surface in uh, uh, I have well my um, my surface in P fifty five, and I I choose sort of points to project from, and if I do this generically, well. You know, generically, you will have. If I take a line uh, like this, then it will only hit the surface once. But the, in co dimension two, it happens that uh, the line will hit twice. Uh, sorry, in co dimension one, it happens, yeah. And then in co dimension three, uh, sorry, co dimension two, it happens that it's, it's actually three to one. So there, there are three points that happen here that map to the same. And it's four to one on a finite set of points. Yeah, so this is uh, not very surprising, but I mean, it just follows from sort of general position arguments uh, for projections. Okay, so, but what does that mean? Well, now we have a morphism from P3 onto our X0. So we know a little bit more about X0. Uh, and we, have, of course, we want to know about curves uh, on X0 and, and their degrees. We want to use X0 as are, are the thing that we want to specialize to. So ideally we want to show that every curve on X zero has degree divisible by five. Okay, so what's the conclusion from all that we've done? Well, if I, if I take a, cer uh, a curve on X zero, well, there are certain things that could happen. Like either the curve, uh, is disjoint from all of these, uh, well, this the surface, this uh, this curve, etc. Then it means that uh, the curve is the birational image from a, a curve uh, in P three, um, or it could actually be a curve inside S. <laughs> um, in in which case, you know, the, um, there would be a, a a curve downstairs that pushes forward to two times the class. Or it could be contain, uh, or it could be the image of that curve, um, and in, in which case we, you would get three times the class. But in any case, there would be a curve inside P three that pushes forward to six times uh, the the curve. It's just uh, these two cases here. If we if we allow ourselves to just multiply by six, then we can at least that, say that six times every curve on X zero is the push word of some, some curve on, uh, on P3. Okay, but now we can compute. So the degree of this uh, thing here, um, of this push word, uh, while well, that degree, uh, well, by definition, the degree is taking the product with H. So by the projection formula, we can compute this uh, intersection number on uh, on P three. So I can take the pullback of H instead and take the product with D. D is this uh, curve that pushes for to six times C. But the whole point is that we have defined phi using degree five polynomials. So we know that the pullback of of this uh, H here is O of five. So <laughs> whatever this D here is, well, the, the intersection number here will be congruent to zero modulo five. Um, okay, so at least now we know that this is a curve which has degree divisible by, by five. But uh, of course, six and five are relatively prime. So if, if this is divisible by five, then so is C or the degree of C. So it implies also that the degree of C is uh, divisible by, by five. Okay, so to summarize the argument, sort of an ingenious uh, way to con construct um, a very singular hypersurface where we can sort of control all the intersection numbers using uh, this uh, map uh, from P3. So of course this uh, threefold here will be very um, singular, but still we can 
can say something about the degrees of all curves on X zero. Okay, so that, that completes the proof of Kolar's uh, result. Um, if we know that every degree, uh, sorry, the degree of every curve on X zero is divisible by five, then this is also true on the specialization or on the generalization uh, where, where everything is smooth. Okay, uh, are there any questions about this result? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so the the theorem you mentioned uh, it works also for any prime numbers p. So, if we take another prime number different from five, then how does what's the image of the so, so what what's the situation? Oh yeah, case? so basically um, five didn't play any role here. It's just uh, you need p to be relative prime to two and three. So you can replace uh, five by p everywhere. Does it make sense? So we would take a piece of our own. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. You would take uh, polynomials. You, you would take still take five polynomials of degree p. Uh, and the, the image of the, the phi is uh, so the fibers of the, the the phi are still bounded by two or three or four in that case. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. So basically, I um, I think I basically w <laughs> proved what I wanted to say. Uh, maybe I'll end with this conjecture here, which is a little bit. Um, I mean, it's a conjecture of Griffiths and Harris, uh, which is related. To, it's, a, it's a it's very hard, but um, yeah. So it says that uh, a very general hypersurface in uh, P four of degree d at least six. So here you don't need uh, p cubed or anything. Uh, if you take a very general hypersurface of, of of that degree, then the degree should be of any curve should be divisible by d. So in particular, at degree 125 hypersurface. Uh, so the degree of a curve on a very general 125 hypersurface should not just be divisible by 5. It should actually be divisible by 125. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, they, they claim this for, for d equals 6, in fact. Uh, so this, uh, it's just a step where this uh, this hypersurface um, becomes of general type. So it's a, it's a very hard conjecture. Um, no results, basically, uh, on this. Um, yeah, but it, of course, it's related to the integral Hodge conjecture. It, it would basically say that the integral Hodge conjecture fails for all of these degrees. And uh, there's no hope of reducing it to d equals 5, because uh, as we all know, the you know, degree 5 hypersurfaces in P4 they contain 2,875 lines on them. So there the integral Hodge conjecture is true. All right, so I think I'll end here. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>